Hi, it's Maria from Still Dreaming Homestead. Good to be back with you. Tonight, we're going to continue reading in our book, On the Banks of Plum Creek, by Laura Ingalls Wilder. We're already on Chapter 20, and it's called School. Remember, Laura didn't want to go. Let's see what happens. Monday morning came. As soon as Mary and Laura had washed the breakfast dishes, they went up excuse me, they went up the ladder and put on their Sunday dresses. Mary's was a blue sprigged calico and Laura's was red sprigged. Ma braided their hair very tightly and wound the ends with thread. She tied them with thread. They could not wear their Sunday Easter ribbons because they might lose them. They put on their sunbonnets freshly washed and ironed. Then Ma took them into the bedroom. She knelt down by the box where she kept her best things, and she took out three books. They were the books she had studied when she was a little girl. One was a speller, one was a reader, and one was arithmetic, which is math. She looked very solemnly, which means serious, at Mary and Laura, and they were solemn too. I'm giving you these books for your very own, Mary and Laura, Ma said. I know you will take care of them and study them faithfully. Yes, Ma, they said. She gave Mary the books to carry. Now see, back then people didn't have very many books just cost too much money. Not like now where we can have lots of books. Um, she gave Mary the books to carry. She gave Laura the little ten, tin pail with their lunch in it under a clean cloth. Goodbye, she said. Goodbye, girls. Be good. Ma and Carrie stood in the doorway and Jack went with them down the knoll. He was puzzled. They went on across the grass where the tracks of Pa's wagon wheels went, and Jack stayed close beside Laura. When they came to the ford, that's the crossing, of the creek, he sat down and he whined <coughs> anxiously. Laura had to explain to him that he must not come any farther. She stroked his big head and tried to soothe out the wrinkles that were worry wrinkles, but he sat watching and frowning while they waded across the shallow, wide ford. They waded carefully and did not splash their clean dresses. A blue heron, that's a special type of bird that hunts fish, rose from the water, flapping away with its long legs dangling. Laura and Mary stepped carefully onto the grass. They would not walk in the dusty wheel tracks until their feet were dry, because their feet must be clean when they came to town. The new house looked small on its knoll, with a great green prairie spread far around it. Ma and Carrie had gone inside. Only Jack sat watching at the ford. Mary and Laura walked on quietly. Dew was sparkling on the grass. Meadow larks were singing. Snipes were walking on their long, thin legs. Remember, that's a type of bird. Prairie hens were clucking and tiny prairie chickens, chicks were peeping. Rabbits stood up with their paws dangling, long ears twitching, and their round eyes staring at Mary and Laura. Pa had said the town was only two and a half miles away, and the road would take them to it. They would know when they were in town when they came to a house. Large white clouds sailed in the enormous sky, and their gray shadows trailed across the waving prairie grasses. The road always ended a little way ahead, but when they came to that ending, the road was still going on. It was only the tracks of Pa's wagon through the grass. For pity's sake, Laura, said Mary, Keep your sunbonnet on. You'll be brown as an Indian. And what will the town girls think of us? I don't care. 
said Laura loudly and bravely. You do too, said Mary. I don't either, said Laura. You do, I don't. You're just as scared of town as I am, said Mary. Laura did not answer. After a while, she took hold of her sunbonnet strings and pulled the bonnet up on her head. Anyway, there's two of us, Mary said. They went on and on. After a long time, they saw a town. It looked like small blocks of wood on the prairie. When the road slipped down, they only saw grasses and, and the sky. Then they saw the house again, always larger. Smoke went up from its stovepipe. The clean, grassy road ended in dust. This dusty road went by a small house and then passed a store. The store had a porch with steps going up to it. Beyond the store, there was a blacksmith shop. Now, blacksmith is where they would work with metal. They might make um, shoes for horses. They might make tools. They might make wagon wheels. It stood back from the road with a bare place in front of it. Inside, a big man in a leather apron made a billow's puff at the red coals. Now, billow was kind of a triangular shaped thing and it had a point um, like a tube coming out the front and two handles and you could squeeze them down and it would blow out air and when it opened it would have air in it again so you could blow and when you blow air on a fire it makes it hotter so that's what he was doing He took a white hot iron out of the coals with tongs and swung a big hammer down on it. Whack! Dozens of sparks flew out tiny in the daylight. Beyond the bare place was the back of, the, of a building. Mary and Laura walked close to this side of the building. The ground was hard there. There was no more grass to walk on. In front of this building, another wide dusty road crossed their road. Mary and Laura stopped. They looked across the dust at the fronts of two more stores. They heard a confused noise of children's voices. Pa's road did not go any further. Come on, said Mary low, but she stood still. It's the school where you hear the hollering. Pa said we would hear it. Laura wanted to turn around and run all the way home. She and Mary went walking slowly out of the dust and turned toward the noise of the voices. They were padding along between two stores. They passed piles of boards and shingles. That must be the lumber yard where Pa got the boards for the new house. Then they saw the schoolhouse. It was out on the prairie beyond the end of the dusty road. A long path went toward it through the grass. Boys and girls were in front of it. Laura went along the path toward them, and Mary came behind her. All those girls and boys stopped their noise and looked. Laura kept going nearer and nearer all those eyes, and suddenly, without meaning to, she swung the dinner pail and called out, You all sounded just like a flock of prairie chickens. They were surprised. But they were not as much surprised as Laura. She was ashamed. Mary gasped, Laura! Then a freckled boy with fire-colored hair yelled, Snipes yourselves! Snipes! Snipes! Long-legged snipes! Laura wanted to sink down and hide her legs. Her dress was too short and it was much shorter than the town girls' dresses. So was Mary's. Before they came to Plum Creek, Ma had said they were outgrowing those dresses. Their bare legs did look long and spindly like Snipes' legs. All the boys were pointing and shouting, Snipes! Snipes! Then 
a red-headed girl began pushing those boys and saying, Shut up! You make too much noise. Shut up, Sandy, she said to the red-headed boy, and he shut up. She came close to Laura and said, My name is Christy Kennedy, and that horrid boy is my brother Sandy, but he doesn't mean any harm. What's your name? Her red hair was braided so tightly that the braids were stiff. Her eyes were dark blue, almost black, and her round cheeks were freckled. Her sunbonnet hanged down over her back. Is that your sister, she said? Those are my sisters. Some big girls were talking to Mary. The big ones, Nettie, and the black-haired ones, Casey. And then there's Donald. See the kids? Kind of see this one a little better. Now this one. And me and Sandy. How many brothers and sisters do you have? Two, Laura said. That's marrying Carrie the baby. She has golden hair too. And we have a bulldog named Jack. We live on the Plum Creek. Where do you live? Does your pa drive two bay horses with black manes and tails? Christy asked. Yes, said Laura. They are Sam and, and David, our Christmas horses. He comes to our house. So you came by it too, said Christy. It's the house before you come to Beatles store in the post office, before you get to the blacksmith shop. Miss Eva Beatles, our teacher. That's Nellie Olson. Nellie Olson was very pretty. Let me adjust this just a bit. Her yellow hair hung in long curls with two big blue ribbon bows on the top. Her dress was thin white lawn with little blue flowers scattered over it, and she wore shoes. See, the girls didn't wear shoes. Not in the summertime, not till it was cold. She looked at Laura and she looked at Mary and she wrinkled up her nose. Hmm, she said, country girls. Before anyone else could say anything, a bell rang. A young lady stood in the schoolhouse doorway, swinging the bell in her hand. Ding, 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 ding. All the boys and girls hurried by her to the schoolhouse. She was a beautiful young lady. Her brown hair was frizzled in bangs over her brown eyes and done in thick braids behind. Buttons sparkled all down the front of her bodice, that's the front of her like blouse, and her skirts were drawn back tightly and fell down behind in big poofs and loops. Her face was sweet and her smile was lovely. She laid a hand on Laura's shoulder and said, You're a new little girl, aren't you? Yes, ma'am, said Laura. And this is your sister? The teacher asked, smiling at Mary. Yes, ma'am, said Mary. Then come with me, the teacher said, and I'll write your names in my book. They went with her the whole length of the schoolhouse and stepped up on the platform. The schoolhouse was a room made of new boards. Its ceiling was the underneath of shingles like the attic ceiling. Long benches stood one behind another down the middle of the room. They were made of planed boards, so made nice and smooth. Each bench had a back and two shelves stuck out from the back over the bench behind. Only the front bench did not have any shelves in front of it and the last belt bench did not have any back. There were two glass windows in each side of the school. They were open and so was the door. The wind came in and the sounds of waving grasses and the smell and sight of the endless prairie and the great light of the sky. Laura saw all this while she stood with Mary by the teacher's desk and they told her their names and how old they were. 
She did not move her head, but her eyes looked around. A water pail stood by the bench by the door. A botan broom stood in one corner. On the wall behind teacher's desk, there was a smooth space of boards painted black. Under it was a little trough. Some kind of short white sticks lay in the trough and a block of wood with a woolly bit of sheepskin pulled tightly around it and nailed down. Laura wondered what those things were. Mary showed teacher how much she could read and spell. But Laura looked at Ma's book and shook her head. She could not read. She was not even sure of all the letters. Well, you can begin at the beginning, Laura, said the teacher, and Mary can study further on. Have you a slate? They did not have a slate. I will lend you mine, teacher said. You cannot learn to write without a slate. It's really like a, um, like a little chalkboard. She lifted up the top of her desk and took out the slate. The desk was made like a tall box with one side cut out for the knees. The top rose up on bottom hinges and under it was a place where she kept things. Her books were there in the ruler. Laura did not know until later that the ruler was to punish anyone that fidgeted or whispered in school. Anyone who was so naughty had to walk up to the teacher's desk and hold out their hand while the teacher slapped it many times hard with that ruler. But Laura and Mary never whispered in school and they always tried not to fidget. They sat side by side on the bench and studied. Mary's feet rested on the floor, but Laura's feet dangled because they couldn't reach the floor. They held their book open by the board shelf before them, Laura studying at the front of the book and Mary studying further on, and the pages between standing straight up. Laura was a whole class by herself because she was the only pupil, which means student, who could not read. Whenever a teacher had time, she called Laura to her desk and helped her to read letters. Just before dinner time that first day, Laura was able to read C-A-T, cat. Suddenly, she remembered and said P-A-T, pat. Teacher was surprised. R a T rat, said teacher. M A T mat. And Laura was reading. She could read the whole first roll in her speller. At noon, all the other children and the teacher went home to dinner. Laura and Mary took their dinner pails and sat on the grass against the shady side of the empty schoolhouse. They ate their bread and butter and talked. I like school, Mary said. So do I, said Laura. Only it makes my legs tired. But I don't like that Nellie Olson. She called us country girls. We are country girls, said Mary. Yes, and she needn't wrinkle her nose, Laura said. That's the end of that chapter. Well, so they met a friendly girl and a not very friendly girl and a real nice teacher. That was cool. So that's where we're going to stop for now. I'll be reading to you again tomorrow. It's Maria from Still Dreaming Homestead. I want to pray blessings on you and yours in your house and out of your house in the day and the night. Whatever you do, keep dreaming. If you haven't pushed that subscribe button yet, Make sure and push that. That way you'll get to see my other videos. And if you hit the notification bell, you'll find out every time I post a video. All right. Good night. God bless.